uh, this session in this format still represents uh, the culmination of our program. This is really, I've always thought of the workshop final briefings as the place where all the knowledge we've gained over the course of the past three semesters comes together as we try to be uh, sustainability problem solvers. I have taken looks through uh, the presentations already. I'm looking forward to hearing them. Uh, it's an impressive uh, group of projects. It really fulfills the, uh, the vision uh, that we had when we started here after Memorial Day. Uh, even during a period like this, this pandemic, uh, the work that we do, if anything, is more important than ever. Uh, we are in a field that focuses on global uh, change and global issues, whether it's climate change, biodiversity, or pandemics. They're all basically the same class of problems, and you're all equipped to address those problems. So we're going to hear from some great presentations. We'll start right away. The first one uh, is on the National Climate Bank. Uh, and uh, this is the group that Professor Jossum advised. And uh, it, the, the uh, client is the is the Coalition for Green Capital. Uh, and the presenter today is Irifili uh, Dracolis. Am I pronouncing that incorrectly? <laughs> Dracolis. Dracolis, okay. So please take it away. And uh, I should say that Stephanie is going to be recognizing uh, the questioners. There'll be up to three questions for each presentation. She'll recognize the person uh, who raises the hand. Uh, and then you get to answer the question. And then uh, after three, we will uh, call an end to this briefing. So uh, let's go to the first briefing. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Global climate change is well on pace to create devastating effects to our known economic, cultural, and social systems and voices all over the world are rising in an effort to shed light on this dire issue. I will be presenting to you today an investment strategy for mobilizing the United States economy toward these calls to action. Good morning, my name is Arafili Jaclilis, and I am pleased to present to you today the work of my group, led by Dr. Sarah Jossum, Jachi Wang, and Mariana Fajardo on how to leverage $35 billion through the proposed U.S. National Climate Bank on um, toward climate mobilization efforts. This was all prepared for the Coalition for Green Capital and a special thanks to our point contact, Nora, Nora Vogel. The Coalition for Green Capital is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that seeks to accelerate clean energy markets through the creation of green banks. Our work this sem semester focused on the National Climate Bank which was proposed to the US Congress through the National Climate Bank Act of 2019, which leverages $35 billion in public funds over the course of six years toward climate related projects. Our role this semester was to conduct expert interviews and review the existing literature in order to devise an investment strategy for leveraging some portion of those $35 billion toward a clean economy for the United States. As the United States alone makes up about 15% of global emissions, and over half of those emissions come from just two sectors alone, electricity and industry. And they were the focus of our research this semester. This chart summarizes um, the research strategy we employed this semester. By the end of this presentation, you should gain a better understanding of the feasibility of each of these technology options and an investment strategy for each of them. For electricity, we looked into offshore wind, and for industry, we looked into energy efficiency, fuel switching, and carbon capture utilization and storage. I will begin with discussing our strategy and findings for offshore wind. This map shows potential and existing project areas for offshore wind leases from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management on the two coasts of the United States. What's important to notice here is the sheer density of potential project area. The United States, with 30 states lining the coast, has a maximum technical potential of about 2,000 gigawatts of offshore wind. That is more than double current U.S. electricity demand. And while wind alone cannot provide all of the supply needed due to its intermittent nature, 
uh, cities and states along the coast are preparing to capitalize on their offshore wind resources. Take, for example, New York State. They passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which requires about 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind be developed by 2035. This is enough energy to power 6 million homes in the state. But the current U.S. offshore wind market is woefully underdeveloped, with only one existing offshore wind plant that provides about 30 megawatts of power to Block Island, which is a small island off the coast of Rhode Island. And this underdevelopment is due mostly to the fact that the United States has um, unusually lengthy environmental and other permitting times, which can delay projects an average of about six to 10 years, thus resulting in major risk for investment. But the National Climate Bank can help incentivize investment in the sector regardless. Take for example, this breakdown of the average capital costs of an offshore wind project. As you can see, about 15% of these costs are made up of uh, financial costs, such as interest on loans. The National Climate Bank can on take some of these costs by providing low to no interest loans and thus decreasing the overall capital cost of offshore wind and increasing the com compet competitiveness of offshore wind over the course of the long term. This strategy can help make offshore wind a viable investment and help increase the, the decarbonization of the electricity sector. Next, we looked into industrial decarbonization. While industry alone accounts for about 22% of all emissions in the United States, there is not a one size fits all strategy for decarbonizing industry as it is quite diverse in its markets. Thus, we looked into a multifaceted approach, beginning with strategies for energy efficiency and then looking into fuel switching and carbon capture utilization and storage. I'll begin with energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is a leading strategy for decarbonization among all sectors, as the best dollar spent is a dollar that can be saved. The process of energy efficiency is simply using energy more efficiently through upgraded appliances and machinery, thus saving on lifetime cost of the equipment by reducing energy use and therefore saving on emissions. And it has great potential for the industrial sector. Take, for example, the Bonneville Power Administration, which is a federally owned nonprofit power marketing administration that started an energy efficiency industrial program in 2010, which provides capital and technical assistance to industries looking to become more energy efficient. Since 2010, the BPA has recruited over 900 industries into this program and saving a cumulative 180 megawatts of power and $400 million in energy savings over the course of the program's lifetime. But energy efficiency alone cannot decarbonize the entire industrial sector, as the fuel that is still used will have to be resourced from fossil fuels to something else. Thus, we looked into methods for fuel switching, and fuel switching is just that, switching from fossil fuels to some other um, source of energy. And first, we looked into electrification, which is an extremely important process for the decarbonization of the U.S. economy, because renewables make electricity, like offshore wind and solar, as opposed to something like oil, which provides heat um, in conventional processes. But to the extent that they can, industries that can use electric power pretty much already do. Take, for example, these uh, graphs on the right here. These were prepared by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and they showcase low, medium, and high electrification scenarios out to 2050. As you can see, industry in red stays pretty stagnant across the board, with some marginal room for improvement. And some industries, like paper and wood processing, are far more equipped to handle electric power than others. But to reach this maximum technical potential of electrification in the industrial sector, it will require about $90 billion in investment of transmission lines uh, to reach industry. And this would result in about a 5 to 15% increase in electricity demand on the electric grid. Not to mention that operational costs for electrification are about 4.2 times higher than the conventional fossil fuel counterparts. Thus, if the National Climate Bank does want to incentivize electrification in the places that it can, it will need to provide loans and financing for industries to retrofit their equipment with electrified um, equipment. So next we looked into hydrogen, which is unique in its capacity to provide both electricity and storage. On the international stage, it is mostly being explored as a transportation fuel, but it does have some industrial applications that are currently being explored on a demonstration basis. 
But today, the problem with hydrogen is that it's mostly being produced uh, through fossil fuels in a process called steam methane reformation. And only about 4%, as you can see here in this graph on the right, is produced through renewables. And this renewable hydrogen is about three times more expensive than its fossil fuel counterparts. Thus, it is only in the research and development phase for industry in the United States. And its ability to decarbonize industry by mid-century is very limited. Thus, we looked into a more developed strategy for fuel switching in the US, which is biomass. Currently, 44% of all biomass used in the United States is already used in industry due to its price competition with fossil fuels. But as evidenced by the residual emissions in the industrial sector, this is not a carbon neutral fuel option. Thus, we recommend the National Climate Bank look into strategies for producing biofuels and making that process less carbon intensive. For example, they can invest in efficient upgrades for processing of biofuels, uh, such as pretreatment, so that the ending process and the ending fuel is less carbon intensive. Secondly, the National Climate Bank could invest in third generation biofuels, such as algae, which are far less carbon intensive and in some cases, even carbon negative. Finally, they can combine a biomass strategy with the aforementioned energy efficiency programs or a carbon capture program, which I will talk about next. Carbon capture is simply the process of sequestering or capturing carbon out of ambient air. Direct air capture is one such technology. And this works particularly well for heat and steam emitting industries, as it can use this waste to power the fans that are used to move ambient air through the equipment to capture, to capture CO2. Excuse me. But this graph demonstrates the primary challenge of direct air capture technology today, and that is cost. The Energy Information Administration of the United States estimates that sequestration technologies can be competitive on the market for about $40 per ton of CO2 sequestered, as evidenced by this line. But today, the operational costs of direct air capture are anywhere from at the very lowest $80 to more like $100 per ton of CO2 um, captured. And when you include the cost of capital over the equipment lifetime, it's more like $200 per ton of CO2 sequestered. While there are some um, federal incentive programs, such as the 45Q tax credit, which provides um, $50 per ton of CO2 sequestered, this still doesn't help direct air capture necessarily meet that $40 market clearing price. And thus the National Climate Bank can invest in this technology through financing to um, help industry become, reach this market clearing threshold. Finally, we looked into post-combustion as a carbon capture utilization and storage technology. As opposed to direct air capture, post-combustion is an end pipe sequestration technology, meaning that it captures CO2 out of flue gas before it even enters into the atmosphere. And it has great potential for the industrial sector. And it is able to reduce emissions by about 90% for a single plant. Today, it is mostly used in fossil fuel production and specifically with coal, but it does have applications for the industrial sector, specifically with chemical processing. The problem with post-combustion is that it is extremely energy intensive and can add additional energy use of about 80 to 120% for industry. Thus, if the National Climate Bank wants to reap the benefits of these 90% emissions reductions, they can invest in retrofitting um, for capital investments for industry to uh, gain this technology and pair this with an energy efficiency strategy to draw down some of the um, energy losses due to this technology. In summary, we advise that the National Climate Bank invest in uh, electric electricity decarbonization through low interest financing for offshore wind. And for the industrial sector, they should take a multifaceted approach, focusing on energy efficiency, fuel switching, and carbon capture utilization and storage. The breadth of technology demonstrated in this presentation should show you, if nothing else, this. There is no shortage of innovation in the climate space. And the National Climate Bank can help accelerate these technologies to market by providing investment for our future before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, if we have any questions, yes, let's all applaud even though you can't see us. <laughs> uh, thank you, very nice, nice work. Uh, and congratulations to the group. Um, 
Uh, Zach, I guess, has raised his hand. Uh, Stephanie, are you going to take over from here? Yep, I can take over. All right, Zach, here. I'm going to unmute you. You're good to go. Hi, Zach. All right, thank you. Hey there. Uh, What's that? Great, pres great presentation. Thanks. Uh, a very uh, a fantastic breadth of innovative opportunities. Uh, there's one thing that I felt, there's a synergy that I felt was missing between two of your recommendations, and maybe it's covered in the report and it was skipped over for the, for the briefing, Cool. but I'm curious if you all explored the possibility of blue hydrogen, which is um, essentially hydrogen uh, production with carbon capture and storage. Uh, green hydrogen is, as you mentioned, both expensive, but also requires uh, an insane amount of energy. You'd have to double the current global capacity of renewable energy just to uh, you know, uh, meet our current hydrogen production with just green hydrogen. So I'm curious if you looked at all into blue hydrogen and hydrogen with carbon capture and storage. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I don't know that we necessarily looked into that extensively because the primary challenge of hydrogen for industrial applications is that it's mostly in the research and development phase and the Coalition for Green Capital wants investment strategies that are ready to be deployed. And so the, there are some challenges with um, hydrogen and the capacity of it to um, work necessarily in industry today is not quite there, but that's a great idea. Okay, another question. All right, Professor Chilred has a question. Hi, enjoyed your talk. So, Hi. you know, under current conditions where people are trying to restart the economy, um, would your analysis change at all if instead of 35 billion in this bank, you had a trillion dollars? <laughs> um, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> um, definitely would increase the potential of us to invest in some of those, um, as Zach was talking about, some of those nascent technologies and maybe deploy a more diverse strategy for sure. Um, it would change a lot of things because of how um, oil prices have changed and how natural gas prices have changed. But because we spent most of the semester kind of focused on uh, pre-pandemic uh, economic scenarios, uh, we didn't necessarily include that in our analysis, but that's a great idea. Okay, we have time for one more question if we have one. And if not, uh, well, thank you for a great presentation. Let's take about a two minute break uh, since uh, we can't go and get bagels. Or I guess you could, but you have to be close by. We'll take a two minute break and then we'll go on to uh, the briefing on agroforestry. So everybody uh, stretch your legs for two minutes and we'll be right back at you. Hey, Jonas, do you want to test if you can control my screen? I mean, does anybody want to hear me talk anymore this semester? Um, <laughs> you can just try moving it to your the screen, next screen. Okay. Um, you should right, be able to just press the arrows. Oops. Yeah, yep. Okay. I, have, uh, I have control. Let me put it back in full screen. All right. Try going back and then forth one more time. Great. Yep. So Stephanie, are we ready for our second uh, presenter? Yes, Jonas is all ready. Okay, so our second presenter, uh, well, was in the workshop group advised by Professor Rosen, and their client was the World Resources Institute, and they're going to focus on agroforestry policy. So let's hear from Jonas. 
So, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jonas Goldman, and I'll be presenting our team's findings uh, in agroforestry through the uh, title "Deep Branching Out: Incentives and Disincentives to Agroforestry." Before I begin, I'd like to give a huge just thank you to the team. This has truly been a joint effort, as well as to our faculty advisor, uh, Professor Rosen, as well as to WRI for working with us. So what I'm going to overview with this presentation is specifically what agroforestry is and why uh, the World Resource Institute is so interested in it, uh, some of the scope of the World Resource Institute's work, uh, how, what our project is and how it fits into this work, um, some of our findings of our project, and then bring it back to how our project's findings fit into the frame of sustainable development. So, Nations throughout the world have degraded the ability of their land to provide key ecological goods and services uh, through forms of land intense development that are reducing uh, their natural capital's ability to provide ecological goods and services. Uh, this is happening to the tune of five to 10 million hectares a year, leaving 23% of Earth's terrestrial surface in a degraded state ecologically. Agroforestry is so interesting because it offers an alternative in that you can have land that provides uh, economic development opportunities while maintaining a higher ecological capacity. Uh, this compared to many existent forms of land intense development such as monoculture agriculture. And I mention uh, monoculture agriculture in particular because at its heart agroforestry is a refutation of monocultural practices. It refers to something that indigenous civilizations have engaged in throughout history where tree species and agricultural crops are cultivated together. Uh, for instance, uh, with uh, timber species and edible tree species such as fruit and uh, cacao and coffee interspersed with ground crops in Mexico. However, um, there are examples in Western Europe, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa. And among the known benefits that indigenous peoples have reaped from these systems and that we hope to emulate are that intermixing the presence of uh, tree and ground crop species can improve nutrient cycling, uh, soil quality, water retention. In some cases, trees can even act as a windbreak uh, to prevent the erosion of soil. Not only that, but uh, agroforestry provides income diversification for farmers. Uh, it recognizes the value of indigenous knowledge and its contribution to society. And improves food security of communities by diversifying their crops wheat grown. Um, but this sort of still asks the question, why is the World Resource Institute interested in what is fundamentally just mixing a few plant species together? Well, um, the World Resource Institute is a think tank with a presence in over 60 countries headquartered in Washington, DC. Its role is to advise nations on um, how they can pursue sustainable development while maintaining the capacity of their natural capital. One major research plank of the World Resource Institute efforts is to advise uh, nations on specifically that, maintaining their natural capital through something called the Global Restoration Initiative which is the goal is to bring 500 million hectares of currently degraded land uh, to a more uh, ecologically sustainable state. And this is why WRI has expressed such interest in agroforestry as it is um, a form of land use that can provide for economic development while maintaining a high degree of ecological goods and services. Uh, because of WRI's interest in agroforestry, our project was built around improving uh, the Institute's working knowledge of the field, uh, specifically what existing uh, policies uh, related to agroforestry found in uh, different nations can either improve or harm the uptake of agroforestry practices. And we looked at existing policy in the cases of India, Brazil, and Mexico. Um, why these three countries? Well, because WRI already has research teams on the ground there, and WRI asked us to contribute by helping to identify their findings and bring them up to a broader level so they can their information can be accessed by uh, the wider WRI NGO and decision makers outside of the national context. Um, and help identify, and we did this sort of by uh, overviewing uh, experts um, in the country, uh, overviewing databases, and uh, government documents on uh, national policies that impact agroforestry. And 
once we took these findings, we I'll put them within a framework uh, to identify these sort of broader commonalities between policy in different national contexts. Uh, and we divided them into incentives, uh, perverse incentives, and disincentives. Uh, incentives are very straightforward. They're mechanisms that promote the uptake of agroforestry, either by strengthening the rule of law, uh, for instance, by um, certifying the punishments for negative uh, agricultural techniques or providing economic funding to agroforestry practices. Uh, then there are perverse incentives, which are well-intentioned policy uh, that still has a negative impact on the uptake of agroforestry. And finally, there are disincentives, which are existing policies that can harm the uptake of agroforestry. For instance, providing uh, fertilizer to monoculture agricultural operations, thus disincentivizing farmers from transitioning their fields. So what are some of the incentives that we identified? Well, um, there is uh, policies that provide training to agricultural producers, um, for providing them the knowledge that they may lack to transition their fields to an agroforestry makeup. Uh, there are policies that provide financial incentives, direct contributions from the government to agricultural producers. In Mexico, this takes the form of Sembrado Vida, where the government is directly financing agricultural producers to adopt agroforest, um, agroforestry methods. Uh, there's the provision of agroforestry inputs, policies that provide seeds and seedlings for farmers to engage in these practices. Uh, there is the um, policies that increase local engagement, allowing for a feedback mechanism between uh, local stakeholders and uh, wider levels of government to make policies more suited to the local context where they will be implemented. And finally, there is access to markets. Um, policies that increase the, the size and the demand for agroforestry products. Uh, you see differences in this, for instance, in Brazil with something called the PNAE program, which um, is uh, the government program that buys uh, locally produ produced uh, food in Brazil for the nation's school system. Uh, and while this has benefited agroforestry, it has not uh, developed the market to a large enough extent to really uh, incentivize the transition of these practices uh, versus if you look at the case of India where you have a very extensive and developed timber market uh, as rural households get most of their domestic energy needs met through uh, the burning timber products. Thus very much incentivizing farmers to transition to agroforestry methods to get that revenue stream. So what are then some of the disincentives uh, to and perverse incentives to agroforestry? Well, there is excessive regulation. For instance, in the case of India, there are older uh, colonial era statutes that forbid the sale of timber products between provinces, uh, thus uh, reducing the size of the market for uh, these products. Uh, is lack of access to credit. In Brazil, this is a significant issue as farmers don't have uh, the credit they need to make that initial capital intensive push to uh, agroforestry methods, uh, buying the trees necessary. There is um, incompatible equipment. In India, uh, many tractors are only geared towards monoculture agriculture, meaning if farmers transition their fields, uh, these sort of capital heavy investments become a sunk cost and somewhat useless. Um, there's the inadequate inclusion of local input. Uh, again, looking at Sembrado Vida, um, the types of uh, crops and trees uh, farmers must grow to be eligible for the scheme are uh, picked by the central government. Uh, without inclusion of local feedback, this can often lead to species being picked that don't grow well in the farmer's local context or the farmers don't know how to grow, thus disincentivizing uh, the farmer's uh, transition to uh, these systems of agriculture. And finally, there's the insufficient inclusion of women and other marginalized groups. And this really varies on the national context and the history of um, culture, uh, misogyny, and just what the, the nation's current state is like. For instance, in India, there has been a greater push to include agri female agricultural producers in agricultural plans. However, uh, the effort to include landless marginalized workers is less developed. Um, so this really depends on the country context.
So what did uh, identifying these uh, policies, incentives, and disincentives do? Well, it allowed us to take uh, the in-team's country research findings and break them out of the information silos of the individual countries, allowing us to identify cross-country similarities and best practices in the uptake of agroforestry. Uh, we hope this will improve uh, WRI's working knowledge of the field and benefit them when they consult with national decision makers so that they can uh, better uh, develop the practice of agroforestry in their respective countries and bring more land to an ecologically sustainable state. Thank you. I will now take questions. Do we have any questions? Yes, everybody's here. Sound of one hand clapping. Any questions for Jones? Oh, Looks like you, you no. got one? Yep. No, it's just more clapping. <laughs> well, Jones, I think you have achieved perfect understanding. Uh, I admire that. Um, and uh, I thought it was an excellent presentation. So, uh, with uh, if there are no questions, we will take another brief break and then we'll move on to our next one, uh, our next presentation. Congratulations, excellent job, group. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. It's been a team effort. <laughs> Kelly, you want to try going to the next page? Awesome. It looks a little small. Let's move back to the original option. I'm going to ungive you control really quick. Sure. Okay, it's just like magic. All right, Kelly, uh, you want to try again? It, this time it'll be with the arrows at the bottom, so you'll have to move to the bottom. Yeah, perfect. All right, Dr. Cohen, I think we're good to go. Okay, so if everybody is ready, um, we're going to move on to our third presentation, which is uh, the analysis and assessment of Iceland's climate action plan for 2040. Uh, Professor McGinnis advises this group. Originally, this group was supposed to go to Iceland, I think, uh, and so th that wasn't possible, so they stayed here. Uh, it was the client is the Government of Iceland Ministry for the Environment and Natural Resources, and if Kelly is ready, uh, let's begin uh, the next briefing. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Rosenziata, and I'm going to be presenting in our group's independent assessment of Iceland's climate action plan. I'd like to just start by thanking my entire team for all of their efforts towards doing this analysis, particularly our uh, managers, Isabel and Laura, and our faculty advisor, Professor McGinnis, for all of their guidance throughout the semester. I want to begin by just introducing everyone to the natural beauty Iceland is best known for. It's waterfalls and it's glaciers, it's blue lagoons, volcanic soils, it's home to the Northern Lights, one of the natural wonders of the world. And it's this natural beauty that brings millions of people every year to Iceland as part of the tourism industry that's a huge driver of Iceland's economy. Our client for this project was the Ministry for the Environment and Natural Resources and the Minister Gumunder. Uh, it's important to point out that Iceland has a very progressive political climate and they currently have a virtually carbon-free electricity system due to the hydro and geothermal energy sources on the island. Our contact was Professor Brynhildr of the University of Iceland and Ingen, a PhD candidate and actually an ESP alum. Uh, they brought us this project and they helped guide us throughout the entire research process. 
So in 2018, Iceland introduced a new climate action plan with two main goals. The first one was to meet their Paris Agreement commitments by 2030, which means reducing their non-industrial emissions by 29% from 2005 levels. And their second goal is to become carbon neutral by 2040, which means either eliminating all of their emissions or eliminating emissions down to a point and then sequestering back up to that point. The plan is laid out in 34 actions under four different topics, clean energy and transport, clean energy and other sectors, land use and forestry, and other measures. Land use and forestry is also known as LULU CF for land use, land use change and forestry. Uh, this is an umbrella term that can refer to various things, but for this presentation, I'm gonna be using it to specifically refer to wetland restoration and reforestation. So the main question we've been tasked with answering is are the steps outlined in the Climate Action Plan sufficient to meet both the 2030 and 2040 targets? Building off of that question, we developed a few follow-up questions we felt would be important to answer in order to fully complete our assessment, including are the current resources being allocated correctly? Are the resources adequate to meet the needs? And are there any further steps that Iceland needs to take in order to complete their now, in order to uh, reach their goals that they set out for themselves? From there, we identified a few critical components of the climate action plan that we wanted to base our assessment on, including carbon sequestration, EU regulations, and innovative technology. We did our literature review to get a better understanding of what the topics were and what Iceland was already doing. And from there, we conducted stakeholder interviews with wetland scientists, sheep farmers, and innovative companies currently operating in Iceland. We use these interviews to get a better understanding of what was happening on the ground, how people felt about the climate action plan, and to fill in any the blanks for any questions that we felt our literature review was unable to answer. We faced a few challenges while doing this assessment. The first one simply being a language barrier. Uh, we often had to translate various documents from Icelandic to English in order to utilize them. We had to navigate the complex EU rules and regulations regarding what can and cannot count towards the Paris Agreement commitments. And unfortunately, we had to conduct all of our stakeholder interviews virtually, obviously via Zoom, uh, instead of in person as we had originally planned. The first thing our team wanted to do was get a better understanding of what Iceland's goals were and what they were already doing to meet those goals. So this graph is demonstrating the 2030 goals for meeting the Paris Agreement commitments. So in the year 2005, Iceland's total non-industrial emissions was 3,000 kilotons per year. A 29% reduction in that brings their 2030 goal down to 2,200 kilotons per year. Current efforts already being taken by Iceland have reduced their non-industrial emissions by about 19% bringing their 2030 projected total non-industrial emissions to 2,520 kilotons per year. That leaves a gap of about 320 kilotons between what is projected and what their goal is. Our team really set out to assess whether or not the steps in the Climate Action Plan could fill that gap of 320 kilotons over the next 10 years. Through our research and our interviews, we're able to come up with five key findings, and I'm gonna spend the next few minutes expanding on each one. Our first finding was that while Iceland's goals are ambitious and multifaceted, there are a few conflicts of interest present at this time, particularly in the land use sector. Uh, right now, uh, people are trying, excuse me. Uh, right now we have sheep farmers, forest restoration and wetland restoration, uh, reforestation and wetland restoration. All of that cannot happen on the same parcel of land. So we do have these different groups who are expressing this inability to meet their goals with one another. Our team determined that an increase in collaboration, interest alignment, and knowledge sharing among these key stakeholders would greatly increase Iceland's chances of meeting the goals it laid out for itself. We determined that LULUCF is going to be vital towards reaching Iceland's 2040 goals of carbon neutrality. Again, LULUCF is referring to land use, land use change, and forestry. Current efforts by Iceland are not enough, but early action and an increase in both wetland restoration and reforestation will have huge long-term impacts towards meeting those goals. On the other hand, due to the time and resources it takes to implement these actions, we do feel that LULUCF is gonna be less relevant towards meeting the 2030 goals of meeting the Paris Agreement commitments. 
Throughout all of our stakeholder interviews, everyone expressed to us that the biggest roadblock they're currently facing is insufficient funding, particularly with wetland restoration. Uh, right now, the Icelandic government is the only funding source for most of these projects. And while they have allocated significant resources towards them in the past, including an additional $50 million committed through the Climate Action Plan, we did determine that an increase in funding will be necessary in order to fully utilize these measures to reach the 2040 goal. Due to EU regulations, LULUCF can only count towards a small portion of the 320 kiloton gap between what is projected and what the goal is for 2030. Uh, filling the rest of that gap, which is about 300 kilotons, is possible, but we are gonna need to see more concentrated efforts in other high emission sectors, particularly transportation, including commercial and heavy trucking, the fishing industry, which is a huge portion of Iceland's economy, and agriculture, which in Iceland is mainly sheep farming. None of these sectors are gonna be able to close that gap alone, and we're gonna to need to see increased efforts across the spectrum. And finally, throughout our analysis, we ran into various data gaps that we determined additional research is gonna be needed in order to fill, including uh, the carbon sequestration potential of wetland restoration, a mapping of the soil types throughout Iceland in order to determine their carbon sequestration potential, and the specific actions needed from other sectors in order to fill the rest of that 320 kiloton gap. Through our assessment, we determined that Iceland's 2040 carbon neutrality goal is achievable, but due to significant implementation and execution issues, the goal of meeting the 2030 Paris Agreement commitments is less certain at this time. In order to address our findings, we came up with a few policy recommendations for the ministry to consider. The first one is an annual emissions reduction summit, which would bring together stakeholders, particularly those in the land use sector, in order for them to collaborate and come up with industry-wide climate goals and actions. To address the increase in funding that we determined would be necessary, we developed a few innovative financing solutions, including grants to landowners for filling in wetlands that had been previously drained and potentially hosting a carbon sequestration marketplace for landowners to earn credits for any carbon sequestration happening on their land. And finally, we determined that an action plan outlining the steps that other sectors need to take to close the gap will be instrumental in achieving Iceland's goals for both 2030 and 2040. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, are there any questions from uh, the group here? Please. You guys can raise your hands if you have questions. Okay, Steve. Oh, we have, yeah, oh, Professor got... Chilred has one. And then somebody else too. I see yep. two hands. Wow. Three hands. Okay. <laughs> so, um, can you put green, green, uh, Iceland's emissions into perspective with other countries? I mean, they're not, they're not necessarily going to meet these goals, but are their emissions tiny in comparison to everyone else? Um, as I mentioned, they do have a virtually carbon-free electricity system. Most of their emissions are resulting from industry and fishing and things like that. So they are, they do have much lower levels of emissions than other countries. Uh, we, when we did this analysis, we did in the beginning kind of address the fact that we are an, coming from an American institution and America has the highest emissions of some of the highest emissions per capita in the world, and we're addressing the emissions of a country with significantly lower emissions than our country. Um, so yes, they do have much lower emissions than other countries, but still they do want to take different steps in order to contribute towards fixing the very large problem of climate change. And what was that green briefcase you had in a picture of the guy walking across the the tundra. Oh, it was um, different saplings for trees. It was, okay. I don't know if it was a briefcase, but it was different saplings for trees for reforestation. Okay. Stephanie, do you have any other questions? I saw yes. two other hands. We have a question from Molly. So Molly, okay. I'm going to unmute you. Hi, Molly. Hi. Um, so I'm really fascinated about the role of, of tourism in emissions. And I understand that Iceland can't necessarily um, how do I want to put this? Emissions from folks flying into the island aren't necessarily their mm -hmm. problem when it comes to emissions, but I'm curious if that was 
something you guys talked about at all or kind of ways that maybe they could offset some of the emissions generated by tourism and by that aviation? Thank you. Yeah, we, we did definitely talk about that in the beginning, how, as I mentioned, tourism is a huge part of their economy. And one of the biggest emissions resulting from it, like you mentioned, was were people flying in. I do only way to get there. Um, we did feel that our innovative solutions team did a look into it, but we felt that it wasn't anything that Iceland can do particularly right now, um, especially because most of the, like you mentioned, it's not really quote unquote their fault. Um, it's not entirely their responsibility to do that, but the various carbon sequestration um, steps that they can take both nat through natural solutions and through um, technology could offset the emissions from people flying to Iceland. Okay, uh, Stephanie, I think we have time for one more question here. Yes, Anastasia has a question. Hi, Anastasia. <laughs> Hi, Kelly, good job. Um, my question is, I guess, along similar vein. Um, I was curious about the plan or what sort of initiatives other sectors would um, engage in in order to reduce their carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the sectors, agriculture, uh, Zach was looking into it and found different ways they can manage their soil and manage manure in order to emit less and actually sequester more. Uh, most of their emissions come from the animals themselves, which is a little bit more difficult to reduce those emissions. Uh, the fishing industry, there we're looking into um, electric versions of the boats, which would eliminate a lot of their emissions from the fuels. Uh, and again, kind of in the similar uh, vein with the trucking industry, which would mainly be a shift towards electric vehicles or potentially biofuel, something like that, uh, in order to eliminate those emissions that come directly from fossil fuels. Okay, Kelly, thank you. Thank you to the group. Uh, so yeah. let's all thank the group one more time. We'll applaud in our own ways. And uh, terrific job, everybody. So uh, thanks again. Let's take a, uh, let's make it a, again a two minute break and then we'll bring on uh, the uh, Adrian Professor Hill's group uh, on uh, biomass. Okay, let's all take a very brief break. Molly, you all set? I think so. Okay, Stephanie, we ready? We're ready. Okay, so uh, our fourth presentation is on the feasibility of biomass for regional energy independence in Northern California, which is where I think uh, Professor Hill is right now. Uh, it's presented by uh, by Molly uh, Dunton, and uh, we're we're very interested in hearing about this. It was done for the Pacific Forest Trust. Molly, go ahead. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Cohen. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, as you said, my name is Molly Dunton and I'll be presenting the feasibility of biomass for regional energy independence in Northern California. Um, I'm proud to represent my amazing team today and I wanna thank our managers, Claire and Maya and, and Professor Hill for a great semester. Um, today I'll be talking about biomass energy as well as our client research and findings. Um, we heard a little bit about biofuels in the first presentation and I'll be speaking to one specific strategy for biomass deployment in California. Our client is the Pacific Forest Trust, a nonprofit forest conservation organization based in California. Their mission is to sustain America's forests for their public benefits. They work primarily with private landowners to manage and use forests sustainably. 
Before COVID-19, California wildfires were arguably one of the worst disasters we faced as a country. And while the pandemic is likely to continue dominating headlines throughout the summer, California is about to enter its wildfire season. Our research focuses on the ways we can mitigate fire risk by improving forest management. Centuries of fire suppression in California have led to a buildup of ladder fuel in the forest. This is dead or downed wood as well as new uh, vegetative growth. As you can see on the left side of this picture, untreated forests with more ladder fuels are less resilient to fires. This fuel is predominantly small diameter woody biomass with no monetary value and the only options for disposing of it are burning it or sending it to a landfill. There are a few other potential uses, but none are currently scalable. The state lacks adequate resources to clear this biomass. Utilizing it for subsidized small scale energy generation has been a part of California's forest management strategy for decades. Additionally, power lines in forested areas can quickly become fire hazards and are often shut down by utilities during strong winds as a way to prevent wildfires. This leaves thousands of residents without power for extended periods of time and frustration with utilities as fostering support for the idea of transitioning off the grid. We looked at a nine county region in Northern California that spans 30,000 square miles and is home to 600,000 residents. This is a heavily forested rural region that provides invaluable ecosystem services, such as drinking water for 25 million people. Much of the region is also located in fire hazard zones. We evaluated whether or not this region can use the surplus of biomass in local forests to minimize fire risk, generate energy, and transition off the grid. To answer this question, we relied on primary sources as well as publicly available data. We had the privilege of speaking with 15 experts from a wide range of sectors, and personally, this was my favorite part of the project. We spoke with conservationists, scientists, foresters, utilities, and government agencies. We then completed five case studies of biomass facilities within the region, three in-depth analyses, and the design of three different scenarios. The first step in our research was to figure out just how much woody biomass actually needs to be extracted from the region's forest to reduce fire risk and determine if the region could power itself with that biomass. There is no official estimate of how much ladder fuel exists in these forests, so we generated our own, approximately 95 million bone dry tons. I should note that our estimate only covered the woody debris or the dead down material and does not even include the new growth. Average annual electricity consumption in the region is 5 million megawatt hours, which equates to roughly 5 million bone dry tons of biomass burned in a power plant. Realistically, the region will never get all of its power from biomass, but this serves as a conservative benchmark for our estimates on supply. We concluded that there is more than enough woody biomass in the region's forests to meet its energy demand. The second step in our research was an environmental assessment of biomass energy and its capacity to deliver net benefits for forests, communities, and the climate. In 2018, California wildfires released almost as much carbon dioxide as the state electricity sector emits in a year. Removing ladder fuels from the forest is essential to reducing wildfires and subsequently reducing carbon emissions. Although biomass is a type of renewable energy, it will never be clean like solar or wind because we're talking about burning wood for power. We analyzed California's estimates for particulate matter and carbon dioxide pollution resulting from wildfires specifically within our region in 2018. We then compared this to the potential emissions from 5 million bone dry tons of biomass energy. Our figures for biomass cover its entire life cycle from the construction of facilities to the transportation of fuels to combustion. You can see in this table that wildfires are a much larger source of potential emissions in the region. We cannot predict the severity of future wildfires, nor are we asserting that biomass will completely eradicate them. What we do know is that biomass energy could incentivize forest thinning and reduce fire risk. Most of the experts interviewed agreed that doing something intentional with this wood is preferable to letting it be fuel for a wildfire. The next step was to determine if an expansion of biomass energy would be financially or logistically feasible. Initially, we explored fully separating the region from the grid, and we found that that would be really costly. A standalone biomass plant can provide electricity during power shutoffs, but to do this, you need to construct new power lines that circumvent the existing grid that would be shut off. Each mile of line costs upwards of $800,000. For comparison, the largest city in our region, Chico, California, has an annual capital expenditure budget of only 1.3 million. 
Additionally, biomass is one of the most expensive types of energy on the market. In California, it's more expensive than solar, wind, and natural gas. New facilities require high amounts of capital investment. Examples in our report range anywhere from 16 to $90 million per facility. Because of these high costs and its low returns, facilities depend on state subsidies to be viable. There are 11 active biomass facilities in the region, currently producing a total of 250 megawatts of power. Several regional timber companies use their own woody waste products to heat and power their sawmills, known as cogeneration. This is a really effective model, but to expand the biomass industry, other types of facilities will be needed. One biomass plant in the region provides power to a city during power shutoffs, and this demonstrates how biomass can support regional energy independence. Existing biomass subsidies target electric utilities, and currently the state mandates a minimum level of biomass energy procurement from fire hazard zones. After determining that separating from the grid was cost prohibitive, our research shifted towards how the region can become more energy secure and minimize fire risk, all while utilizing the current grid. One option is to place biomass facilities at substations within the region. Pacific Gas and Electric, or PG&E, is the primary electric utility in California, and they were recently found to be liable for billions of dollars of wildfire damage. As part of their settlement, they are investing in microgrids to make the California energy system more resilient. We spoke to pg e directly about the potential to integrate biomass power plants into these microgrids. A second option is community choice aggregation, a tool often used by communities to take control of their energy mix and integrate renewable energy. CCAs can work with utilities or local facilities to purchase biomass power. We faced some challenges in our research, but I'm happy to say that none of them proved to be real barriers. Uh, the main challenge that we faced was multiple research objectives. On one hand, we want to protect the forests, but on the other, we're analyzing a controversial energy source. We had to come to terms with the fact that biomass energy is never going to be an ideal climate or public health option, especially when compared to other renewable energy sources. Biomass is not the easy or obvious choice, but this actually made for a fascinating semester for us. The second challenge we faced was working with a diverse group of stakeholders from the community level all the way up to state government. This is a complicated issue with a lot of calculations around externalities and trade-offs and how those calculations are done depend entirely on who you are and what your priorities are. We were mindful of this and tried to be as objective as possible. Finally, there is a lack of data from the region on things like the available fuel stock in the forest. What we completed was a preliminary analysis based on the available data, but further research is definitely needed. So to conclude, our research led us to several key findings. Biomass energy can be an effective tool for forest management, and we determined that there is sufficient biomass available to power the region. But is it environmentally preferable? If you compare biomass energy to wildfires, it wins. But if you compare it to low carbon solutions like wind and solar, it loses. Its economic viability is also questionable. The existing industry relies heavily on subsidies funded by utilities and ratepayers but these subsidies need to be expanded for the industry to grow and it will be politically challenging to raise more public funding. We determined that it is not economically or logistically feasible for the region to separate entirely from the grid, but that there are options for biomass facilities looking to integrate with existing grid infrastructure. Biomass energy can certainly be a short-term strategy for forest management, but it will never be a long-term solution. Additionally, California is aiming for 100% clean energy by 2045, and seeing as biomass is not carbon neutral, facilities will need to be phased out by then. Some experts believe that with effective forest management, it's possible to get the forest to a stable state within 20 years and before this deadline. The urgency of wildfires demands swift action and biomass energy represents one potential solution. Thank you and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the group? <laughs> I see a lot of a lot of hands on applause. Okay, Zach has a question. All right, Zach, you should be unmuted. A topic that I was really interested in pursuing as well. So I'm glad that uh, that you all did a great job with it. Um, I've long accepted I've, that I've become a broken record. So I'm just going to ask the question. Um, uh, to what extent do you all look into bioenergy with carbon capture and storage? Um, I, I, I think I heard from you all that you all look into it a little bit. Um, I, if I had to hazard a guess, it's probably because it was economically unfeasible for the region. But if you could talk a little bit about that, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. 
Sure. Um, thanks. I mean, definitely right off the bat, it is extremely expensive. Um, but I think that there's some other things I would like to mention as well. California has um, pretty stringent um, air permitting requirements and regulations already. Um, so, you know, there's sort of a balance between California is sort of a leader in that space. And, you know, again, there's always going to be particulate and pollution from these types of facilities to, to the degree that you can um, use modern technology and scrub some of that pollution away, the better. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of the sort of community scale facilities we were looking at, that kind of technology is just not carbon capture specifically is not feasible. But again, I, I would say that a lot of these facilities are using um, so, some more modern kind of smokestack scrubber technology. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, I, I think, do I see a question from Josh? Yep, Josh should be unmuted. Uh, hey, Molly, nice job. Congratulations to you and your team. I was just curious, could you elaborate a little more on how you estimated the volume of dry material that was available? Uh, was that based off of maps or USGS work? Um, yeah, so there's actually a Forest Service uh, methodology for sort of estimating this. Um, it's not a perfect science um, because even with the best models, we can't necessarily factor in things like rugged terrain and access to the material. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's a very highly variable um, pool of data. It really kind of depends on who you ask and what assumptions you know, people were using in their reports. Um, but we did rely on a forest service methodology to at least estimate the amount of sort of dead down wood. Um, and again, that wood could be at different stages of decomposition. Um, so not all of it might even be good for biomass energy, um, but we wanted to kind of get a sense of, you know, how much of this stuff is there at least to start. Um, and I would also stress again that it doesn't include the, the new sort of green vegetative growth in the understory, which can also be an important ladder fuel. Okay. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Yeah, Alyssa was curious what findings you may have come across that take existing ecology into account with the strategy. Absolutely. Um, I'm glad someone asked about this. Um, our research and our report in this presentation, you know, really focused on sort of the, the emissions comparison and, you know, really trying to, to figure out if this would produce net emission benefits, net emissions reductions. Um, but we did come across a lot of other sort of environmental, ecological, trade-offs. Um, so an example of a positive thing that's not emissions related, um, thinning out the forest can actually improve water capture and can actually help the health of the local watershed. Um, unfortunately, there is some concern among scientists that you could over thin the forests and that manual thinning, so using machinery, might actually reduce the biodiversity of the forests. So these are just two examples to show you that this is really, biomass is kind of a can of worms and there are trade-offs around every corner. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, uh, and thank for the thank the group for an, another excellent uh, excellent presentation and a very nice job. So let's let's give the group uh, a virtual uh, round of applause or even a physical one. Thank you, Molly. Um, well, again, let's take a, a brief break, uh, and then we'll go to our final final briefing, which will be on uh, water reuse in New York. Okay, so let's take a two minute break, everybody. Denisha, are you ready to go? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, everybody. Our final, final briefing uh, is uh, about water reuse uh, in New York City. It's done for the city's Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, faculty advisor was uh, uh, Dr. Nancy Degden and uh, Janisha 
is going to uh, fill us in on the details of their project. Uh, take it away. Good morning, everyone. I'm Janisha Shrestha, and I'll be briefing you on behalf of our workshop team regarding a water reuse strategy for New York City. Um, I'd like to thank our faculty advisor, Dr. Nancy Degnan, and our workshop managers, Caitlin and Bai, for all the support and guidance throughout this unique semester. As for our agenda today, first, I'd like to talk about the context of our project and introduce our client. Next, I'll go over our objective and the methods we use to conduct our research and then present our key findings and recommendations for our client. But before I proceed, let me give you our working definition of water reuse. Water reuse is also known as water recycling or water reclamation, where wastewater and rainwater is intentionally captured and treated through multiple purification processes and then repurposed for potable use as in drinking or non-potable use as in toilet water, laundry, or irrigation. New York City is considered to be water rich, meaning it has abundant water resources with the infrastructure to deliver clean, high quality water, as well as effectively handle wastewater. As you see on this map, the city has an extensive drinking water supply system to deliver almost 1 billion gallons of water to 9 million residents on a daily basis. It comprises of about 2000 square miles of watershed north of the city and about 7,000 miles of water mains, tunnels, and aqueducts. The city's wastewater management system is just as extensive. There are 7,400 miles of sewer lines, 96 pump stations, and a system of 14 treatment plants that collectively treat about 1.3 billion gallons of wastewater each day, which is ultimately discharged to New York harbors. So why should New York City, as a water-rich city, think about water reuse? First is our aging infrastructure and the need for its repair and maintenance. The Delaware Aqueduct, which supplies nearly half of the city's water, is currently leaking about 20 million gallons a day. And its planned repair in 2022 has already prompted the city to enact a water demand reduction plan. Second is the issue of combined sewer overflows, where intense rain events cause storm water mixed with untreated sewage to be directly discharged to our waterways because our treatment plants are unable to handle the increased flow. So on-site water reuse systems can help reduce the burden on our wastewater treatment plants and prevent these overflow events and subsequent waterway pollution. Moreover, it can also help reduce emissions from our treatment plants, which is currently the second largest producer of methane in New York City. Third is water reuse's role in advancing climate change resilience. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy's storm surge flooded the city's pumping stations and wastewater treatment plants, rendering them non-operational for four days and spewing nearly 2 billion gallons of raw sewage into the waterways. In contrast, the Solaire, a Battery Park City building complex with an on-site water reuse system, continued to provide uninterrupted wastewater treatment. By implementing a citywide water reuse strategy, the city can increase its resilience and protect people, commerce, and the environment. For these reasons, our client, Mr. Alan Cohen, the Managing Director of Integrated Water Management at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, wants to be proactive and design a water reuse strategy for the city. This semester, Mr. Cohen asked our team to summarize the questions, challenges, and opportunities for water reuse in New York City, and to make recommendations that highlight programmatic realities of setting up a water reuse strategy by documenting lessons learned from the experiences of other municipalities in the country. In discussions with our client, he suggested a research framework that was both very helpful to DEP and also helped guide our inquiry process. It included looking into the technology, public health, finance, and governance considerations. This framework was the foundation to our research method. As for our research methods, we reviewed seminal literature on water reuse policy and practices within the US and internationally, as well as we conducted phone interviews with 13 experts to probe for insights, guidance, and advice regarding the four components of our framework, which ultimately helped us develop a set of distinct recommendations for New York City. The experts we interviewed included public sector policymakers and practitioners from three renowned water reuse cases in the US. These include the city of San Francisco and Orange County in California, 
and the city of Austin in Texas. We also talked with representatives from the private sector, engineers, scientists, and decision makers throughout the country. Now, let's move on to our key recommendations presented through each component of our framework. Due to the lack of space and aging infrastructure, it is quite challenging to develop a centralized water reuse plant in New York City. Therefore, we recommend that the DEP frame their approach to promote decentralized systems. Using a combination of individual building and district scale water reuse systems will help address the unique density issues in the city. For instance, homeowners on Staten Island will have a different reuse system than large capacity buildings like the Solaire in Battery Park. As one of our experts, Venetia Lannan from Matrix New World Engineering and a fellow MPA alum suggested, the city should allow the markets to determine the type of technology to use rather than having a public sector mandate to use one technology over another. Public health has been the primary concern for water reuse systems at any scale due to the human health risk from opportunistic microbial pathogens and chemical contaminants. The current coronavirus outbreak has only heightened these concerns. While technology already exists to treat reclaimed water to levels that meet or exceed health standards, only having adequate technology and capacity is not sufficient. So we recommend the DEP to work closely with the public health and buildings department, as well as the private developers to set up frequent monitoring, testing, and oversight of all water reuse systems. They should revamp and upgrade training to ensure that operators monitor for all pathogens, use appropriate purification technologies, and consistently report their findings to ensure public safety. The good news here is that all of our, in all of our case studies in Austin, San Francisco, and Orange County, they have reported zero health issues so far associated with their water reuse systems. In terms of finance, the cost for decentralized systems depend upon their capacity, scale, and space constraints, and fall primarily on the building owners. Cost effectiveness is based on their return on investments. According to Ed Clerico of Natural Systems Utilities, cost estimates for these systems range between $18 to $50 per gallon, with smaller systems being more expensive. A system like the one at Solaire with a capacity of 25,000 gallons per day has a 10-year return on investment, whereas larger district-scale systems can provide a return in investment in less than five years. Given these differences in cost, we recommend that the DEP conduct more research to create and share financial guidelines that detail these figures for developers so that they, 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 so to help with transparent financial planning. If possible, the city should expand its existing grant program and offer incentives to encourage developers as well as homeowners to install these systems. In each of our case studies, the public sector managers emphasized that governance was a critical piece of water reuse effectiveness. We recommend that the DEP approach the establishment of standards, practices, and ordinances through an early and iterative collaborative process with city agencies including the Department of Buildings, Health, Sanitation, Economic Development, and Mayor's Office, just to name a few, as well as engaging external stakeholders, include, including the public and the private sector. Finally, as Taylor Chang of San Francisco Public Utilities noted, it is critical to identify a lead agency to direct and implement the water reuse strategy. Water has been central to the development of New York City. Without the pristine reservoirs upstate, and the extensive, extensive infrastructure, the city could not have grown to the size that it is today. A water reuse strategy offers new workers the opportunity to optimize the city's existing system, promote water conservation, and prepare for climate change. When done right, it can be safe, innovative, and supportive of the city's path towards resiliency in the 21st century. Finally, we look forward to sharing our final report and findings with our client virtually on May 8th. Thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? Any questions from, okay, I see Anastasia has a question. All right, you should be unmuted, Anastasia. Yep. Good job, Janisha, well done. Um, my question 
for you was um, you said you researched some examples from around the world. Um, can you give an example of uh, countries that are doing well and, and does, is it possible for New York to adopt some of these wastewater treatment systems? Um, so we looked at some international cities like Singapore and whatnot, but a lot of the cases that we looked at came out of the necessity to have a water reuse system because there are water scarce areas. And New York is a unique case because it's a water rich city. But at the same time, it is feasible that New York can have a water reuse system. But as I mentioned, on a more of a decentralized scale where buildings or a group of buildings share one system to re for reuse rather than having a big treatment plant like the one in Orange County, they have a massive treatment plant that kind of serves the entire city. So the, I think for New York, the technology is specific to the buildings versus like a city-wide scale. Gotcha. Other questions? Okay, well, Janisha, thank you for a wonderful job and thank the group. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, let me offer a few concluding thoughts for uh, the session. First, I want to really thank the entire workshop for pivoting uh, halfway through the semester and figuring out how to do this without seeing each other. Uh, these projects and the reports uh, are excellent. They're the same high quality projects we've always seen in the spring workshop. and so. And I'm really proud of what you've done and, and what the faculty advisors have done. Uh, this workshop has always been, as I said at the beginning, the culmination of the program where we take science and policy and economics and management and politics and ethics and put them all together to try to address problems that are going to be the same problems that we're going to face as professionals. I think, you know, I'm sitting here on Morningside Heights and I can hear the sirens outside. My, uh, the, my window uh, brings me two sounds primarily, uh, birds from Morningside Park and, uh, and sirens uh, from St. Luke's Hospital down the street. And uh, it, it tells us a little bit about, about the world we're in. But what we have been doing here for the past year is really the same thing the world needs desperately, which is to try to figure out a way to understand the scientific complexity of the planet and our technology uh, and the way we live and develop effective public policies and management practices so we can enjoy the benefits of this technology uh, without suffering through uh, the uh, kinds of uh, impacts that we're having today. So the professional skills that you have been developing starting with the summer of environmental science uh, really makes you a very important science communicators in the world. People who are not scientists but understand its importance and know how to translate it into the public policy and management practices that the world's going to need. And if anything, we're going to see over the next uh, decade uh, a higher level demand for this kind of expertise. Uh, I've written about this before. If you read my blog, it's like, oh, well, I'm writing about these days. But one of the things that, that I remember from uh, September 11th is that after September 11th, uh, the security and anti-terrorism industry uh, was uh, a boom town. And I think we're going to see the same thing with uh, the technology of uh, virus uh, research and prevention, uh, which frankly is the, really the same thing about invasive species and ecosystem protection. Um, as a class of problems, the problems of the coronavirus are really no different than the very difficult problems that we're dealing with, whether it comes to uh, how do you reuse water, to what do we do about uh, the forest uh, and forest fires, and how do we generate energy, how do we address the climate change issue. All of these issues are the same kind of issue that we're facing right now. And the skills that you're developing are the exact skills that the world needs. If anything, uh, like I said, I, I think this is now becoming more obvious and more important. So uh, over the next few months, uh, as you, you know, we've already held one networking session with alums, and I think we had 28 students and 28 alums present. We're going to do more of these things. Uh, 
The job market is going to work in funny ways over the next couple of months, uh, but I can tell you that I, I'm beginning to see lots of activity in our field. Uh, there, there are things that uh, need to be done, uh, and we're well trained to do it. So I want to thank all of the faculty, all of the students uh, that, that are here today uh, for really a spectacular job. I'm, I can't tell you how how proud I am of the of the work you've done. We've been uh, at this now for uh, almost two decades, and uh, and I have to say uh, what I'm seeing today uh, really justifies the investment of time and effort that so many of your predecessors have put in, many of whom you've been meeting, and many of whom you will meet. And so personally, uh, I'm moved and, and touched by what I see today and what I see you all doing. And if I can be helpful to anybody as you are, are uh, approaching your professional needs uh, and you're trying to make those connections, please reach out to me. I'm sure that my fellow faculty feel uh, the same way uh, and we're, we stand ready to help you. Uh, I know that Louise and uh, Sarah and, and uh, Nancy and, and, uh, and uh, Eileen or, or and Adrian are all ready to, to do that as are the, the rest of the faculty. So, uh, Thank you again, and I'll call this to a close. Uh, I wish we were uh, sharing uh, some food in the back of the Kellogg Center, but I will say this. Uh, when we're able to get back together, we're going to have a party somewhere on campus, Casa Taliana or something, and it won't be bagels. Uh, you know, I, I'm holding on to a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue that I intend to bring to that party. So uh, we'll see you whenever we can.